Well, hey guys, welcome back to No Talks Allowed. This is an exciting episode here today because, you know, uh, we discovered that there is a very big security issue coming down Microsoft Windows that uh, they decided to make a change on. But before we get in too deep here, I need to introduce myself because apparently nobody knows who the heck I am. I, uh, I am apparently the host named Josh. And then this guy is that you're seeing right here beside me on the video. Uh, he's a Big Pod guy. He goes by a different name, but everybody just knows him as Big Pod. So he, he calls himself Big Pod. How's it going today? It is going great. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. Okay. So, uh, Big Pod. I, I know I just joked about it, but uh, Windows Recall. Yeah. What what do you think about it? In theory, a good thing. In practice, not so much. It is as a, if I completely, uh, completely remove all the about privacy, all that. Like from just look at the feature. It's an, actually an interesting feature. Uh, a good feature because well, you can you can ask what you did and get like what you actually did, which is like actually bringing some sort of like real intelligence to the question, to the copilot on your computer. Problem is, at the same time, it's watching you, what you do, and that can be pretty much privacy nightmare. Any, and depending on how it's done or what kind of access other people have to your computer, a security nightmare. Okay. Okay. What so, do you think? Uh, so, uh, first of all, let me explain how recall is built to as to how it works, right? Uh, so, Microsoft, what Microsoft Recall is, it's a feature built into the operating system, in this case being Microsoft Windows, where every few seconds, it takes a screenshot of what you're doing. And then uh, it uses an AI pro a uh, program that's uh, supposedly hardware accelerated on modern computers and that uh, analyzes that image and comes up with a summary of everything that's going on in that. Yeah. Now, uh, that initially is probably what triggered everybody is that it's a screenshot and then somebody used the word AI in it. <laughs> so yeah. there's already... Two crowds that don't there you have you have the security crowd that's just not appreciating that you know Microsoft's taking screenshots of your desktop operating system nowadays, and then you have the AI haters who uh, see the word AI and just automatically hate on it because AI. Yeah. But uh, so I I saw the headlines, and my very first thought is I need to go look into this a little bit, just a little bit, and I found a a uh, page that Microsoft has of frequently asked questions. And what do you think the very first question was, Big Pod? I don't know. What was it? Is this secure? <laughs> 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 hey, guess what Microsoft basically says? I mean, you're probably looking it up right now. But they basically say, this is not secure. And But then they go into details of explaining how it works. Now, apparently... All of these screenshots and the output data for the AI are locked in an encrypted in, are locked into an encrypted folder on on your computer, and it is supposedly all locally kept. Uh, we'll see how long that lasts. Yeah. But uh, this is in theory a good idea for when your computer is turned off. But let's look at the let's look at the use case of a laptop. Big Pod, do you have a laptop? Yes. Is your laptop right currently here. turned on or off? Currently it's off. Is it actually turned off or is it just the lid closed? It's off. Okay, okay. You're already I, better. I'm You're one of those better. insane people yeah. who actually shut down their laptop between. Yeah. Um, moving. And the reason for that is, uh, like, my old laptop had problems with S3 sleep state. And I was like, putting it in the in the bag every every time I close it because I was using it in school. So guess what sometimes happened? 
it didn't actually Someti- go to sleep. Someti- yeah, sometimes you uh, open up the laptop and find out the battery's dead. <laughs> no, this wasn't the problem. Yeah. I pull it out and it's hot. Oh, yeah, that too. My, because you uh, know, bat- battery, it's, it's been, it's it destroyed been, my battery, it destroyed the RAM. So yeah, yeah I, w- I wasn't a fan of it. So I got at the time used to actually shutting it down every every 45 minutes essentially because from class to class. Yep. And now I just do it like, I can wait those four seconds when I press this, the power up button. I can wait those four seconds. Yeah. Now, you're already better than nine, probably like nine out of every 10 people that I talk yeah. to about this. Yeah. Because, you know, I have to explain disk encryption to people. And, yeah. you know, the disk is only ever actually locked when it's turned off. Yeah. Because when you turn it on and you unlock that disk, it's going to stay in that unlocked space until you turn it off. Yeah. I this had, is why... Uh, when I mentioned disk encryption, I had had a discussion with a couple of people a couple of days ago about uh, using TPM as a decryption key. So no <laughs> password, which is one of the most head-scratcher things for me that ever existed. What's the point? Like, I'm more afraid of the whole laptop being stolen than just the disk. <laughs> right. Which is essentially the only thing it protects against. But then again, if you if you actually like trust the S3 state, yeah, it makes sense. That you wouldn't care because, yeah, you're effed either way. Yeah, okay. So, uh, obviously... Uh, I had some very big issues with this and, uh, you know, it, I wasn't the only one because if you, I have seen every single like YouTuber who does anything el- relatively remotely relating to tech post a video about this and I not didn't. a single, <laughs> well, yeah, you did it, but how often Neither. do you actually post a video? Because, you know, I sure as hell didn't, I haven't posted anything in months. Well, but, uh, I, I probably wouldn't either, but uh, like, but, to be just not a topic, interesting topic. Like, I knew it was gonna happen. I knew it was gonna change things. Well, I mean, we already knew that Microsoft was going to pack AI into Windows somehow. Yeah, <laughs> and they have to sell it up. They have to sell it to the normal person who's probably not going to just have a conversation with the AI fighter front yes. of it yes. after you know the, the first time yeah but, and, uh, and they won't just be looking for basic things they would want something to have like they, actual intelligence and actual memory or you know something that's actually just useful yeah so uh and we all know that the, that the standard windows user i'm i'm not talking your power user if you're if you're currently writing an email going like i'm using microsoft windows and i'm just turning recall off well first of all that doesn't actually uh, you don't have to do that anymore but Second of all, if you knew what recall even was, you're not the standard Windows user. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, I'm just going to say this right now for you. You are not the standard Windows user if you even know what recall is. <laughs> and uh, I'm not saying... But uh, anyways... I have, I have uh, a better definition. If you changed any setting in your computer, you're, you're already a power user when it comes to Windows. <laughs> Are you saying I'm a normal person because I haven't changed the desktop wallpaper on my last seven or eight installations? Of the, you are, of you are in a majority. System? You are in a vast majority <laughs> okay. when it comes to okay. that. Vast I'm glad that there's something. Don't do it. I'm glad that there's something about me that you find normal. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let's be clear. I I haven't changed. I haven't changed in years uh, the wallpaper. Unless I went to the grayscale version, which is basically, basically, very creative. I went from yeah. the actual version to a grayscale version. Very creative, yeah. and even that was a chore to do for me. Well, anyways, uh, Microsoft came out just earlier today as we're recording this, saying that hey, we heard you. We're not going to have this turned on by default. And of course, Big Pot, as we're recording this, uh, a certain really large Canadian YouTuber just published a video saying that, hey, this thing's getting turned on on your computer. <laughs> <laughs> Which I find hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I, what I found funny, the, the whole situation is people were saying, 
Microsoft is silent about recall. They all the talk about is positive things about it. They're not they're not responding. Of course they're not gonna be responding to to people until they actually know what the response will be. They're they are not YouTubers. They are not they're not exactly. small company. Like they they actually understand that if you wanna do a proper response, you have to do a proper measured response. And this is exactly what this is. Yeah. They looked at the stinks, they looked at how to best to keep the feature in, but at the same time make it that it would be okay to the public. Or at least for the large part. And disabling by default is that that option, but you cannot change that like at a drop of a hat, especially not at a, co at a company the size of Microsoft. That's not yeah, how, and... how reality works for that kind of company. When things have to go through hundreds of people before the decision is actually properly made. That has positive things and bad things about it. Oh well. Yeah. Honestly, as soon as as soon as you know you're operating in a business environment, it's going to operate at a very different pace from from an individual yeah. person. And I and, can say that as a guy that operated a, a small business for a little while. And even it then, was nothing as, on the scale of Microsoft. And even then, as soon as you go into the enterprise level, it's gonna go even slower. That yep. business, the size you operated, or even let 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 the use word quite larger are compared to enterprise far more agile. Yep. And uh I'm I'm glad that they that they saw, that they've come to decision to turn it off. But yep. uh it <clears throat> I haven't found anything yet that says that it's going to stay turned off. Yeah, but that's So we might be having this discussion again in the future. Yeah, but what even but, if they say they're gonna keep it off forever, forever it has a very, very questionable timeline on the internet. Yeah, not I just mean, for Microsoft, uh, for everybody. It, yeah, because you know <coughs> Microsoft Edge was never supposed to be the default web browser. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but of course, uh, in the world of free and open source software. Uh, all the BSD guys, all the Linux guys, they're all saying that, hey, this is the year of the Linux desktop. This is the year no, of the BSD not. desktop. <clears throat> no, it's not. Uh, I mean, if if you look at last week, we were reporting that there's more people using Linux than ever before, according to Steam. Yeah, but that's not everything. Like, we're still at 2%. We're still yeah, I, nothing. I, mean, I, I, I went on Reddit. And if I'm looking at slash r slash Linux, going like I have switched to Linux after installing Windows, and and this is actually pretty cool looking. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're going to see like maybe a point zero five desktop increase just from Microsoft Recall alone. There there are some migrations <laughs> because yeah. of Recall, but I think it's gonna stay in probably a few thousand people. Yeah, it, it's it's not gonna it's not gonna be like the big swing toward that that Linux needed for the desktop market. I I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, the only thing that will that will cause that to happen is Linux being pre-installed on devices. One thing I think it might if if Recall stayed what it was and how it was, maybe it would because of businesses. I mean, but if there businesses... are business there are business yeah. versions of Microsoft Windows. And that's the thing. Like, if Microsoft stayed at that, it has to be it is enabled by default, and it would be hard to disable for administrator. They probably would look, especially like uh, businesses where where they do a lot of confidential data. They would look at Linux. But outside a lot of, of them that, use Linux. Yeah, but not that many actually. Like, yeah. How many how many pharmaceutical companies use Linux on desktop? Uh... And, and companies like that. I'm not. I'm not yeah. gonna go into the numbers because I don't know them. I, I be guess pure you're speculation, right. But what I'm trying to say is that that companies actually care about their privacy. They still use Windows. 
and that needs to change. That needs to change for Linux to actually have effect because honestly, a lot of business business users would of users who use computers at business, and if they would be uh, forced to switch to Linux at work, it's more likely they would switch to Linux at home because they would want to stay stay current at their at their job because you know if they're not current they are slower than everybody else what can happen especially in yeah. us but yeah uh i think i i think that honestly if you're listening <coughs> to this part if you're listening to this podcast right now and uh, you're you're not a typical Linux user, and you're and this has like increased your interest in Linux. I'm not gonna say that don't don't try it, uh, because you know I always think that it's worth trying new things. Uh, that's yeah, that's one of the many reasons as to why I'm a quote unquote distro hopper, even though uh, I typically tend to go back. <laughs> <laughs> but uh. It, it's always worth trying the new th- the new things because it's always worth trying to see if like there's something that you can do better. <coughs> yep. And, and we can only realistically grow as people if we do the thing that we're not used to doing. Like you know, uh, actually publishing YouTube videos so we can call ourselves YouTubers. Yeah. Or uh, you know, uh, changing, getting rid of all our clothes and only wearing white shirts. For because that's all we that's all we own <laughs> or uh you know buying buying a manual car instead of an automatic who knows you might enjoy driving again well manual is yeah. the, the better one that that well that much it i is, can say it, it is better but uh you know i i had to drive through a city very recently and now i remember why why uh i i have a somewhat of a preference for automatic transmissions yeah. Well, but, but you know, the manual transmission is fun. <laughs> I can say that much. But uh, when I drove cars, I drove exclusively manual. I was taught on manual. Well, I mean, if if you learned on it, yeah. I had I, figured out because you know manuals are not the standard in North America. Yeah, I believe I drove automatic once. Yeah, I like it doesn't matter to me which one it is, but. I, I I did reach reach for the shaft way too often, and there was no <laughs> shaft, or or like there some... was, but it was kind of useless. Yeah, uh, there's something missing. <laughs> yeah, but anyways, uh, go ahead go ahead and install like your a Linux distro that you just randomly find on Google. It's probably Ubuntu based, and uh, give give it a spin and give it a whir, uh, because you know uh you you blue big pod you blue. Does not show up number one on Google yet. Yeah, I know. It might one day, but it's not there yet. <clears throat> it's it's a small project. It cannot compete with Canonical. Cannot I compete mean, that, with that's true. Fedora. Canonical Canonicals Canonicals uh, paying those advertising mo- dollars. You know, not uh, just that. Th- we shouldn't be number one because we do not have support network yep. proper to actually do anything. Maybe yep. one day. Maybe, maybe. But it's also a big birthday in the in the uh news space for Linux. Uh really? now, yeah, it it actually kind of is, at least for me. Uh I personally feel like it's a it's a pretty big day. Cause uh Pharonix has marked twenty years of of their website existing. Now, uh Pharonix is a technology news website. That tends to cover just hardware and Linux. Yeah. And uh, Michael Larbal is the guy behind it. And he works day and night. How do I know this? Because I have an RSS reader that re- that pulls from Pharonix. <laughs> and uh, I have read this website for over 10 years. And a lot of the articles are very short, very to the point. You can basically learn the entirety of the article from just the headline alone, but it came out at two in the morning, and then next one came out at three in the morning, 
And the next one came out at seven in the morning. So you know when Michael Mike actually got some sleep. Yeah. But uh, this guy works really hard. And uh, th- just this morning at at six in the morning, of course, uh, he posted these are the most popular articles that we've featured over the last twenty years. So uh, this is stuff like them talking about Asus motherboard shipping with an embedded better Linux that had a web browser or his tour of Chernobyl. Uh, benchmarking Ubuntu versus Open Solaris versus uh, FreeBSD, because you know back when those other two operating systems were relevant. Uh, for Onyx posting th- their first review of the Raspberry Pi three, which I think they were one of the first outfits to actually benchmark that. Uh, AMD uh, creating Rock Rockham to uh, compete compete against uh, CUDA. Now that's a competition. Yeah. It's. I mean, it's not yeah. even not even in the same realm, but okay. Yeah, it's not not even in the same realm. Uh, sorry, but Nvidia is a little too embedded in that market right now. Uh, and then here, uh, the truth about ATI, AMD, and Linux, because you know, uh, this I think this ca- this one came out when uh, AMD switched over to the AMD GPU driver, dropping Radeon SI, and was it really as great as people said it was? In some aspects, yes. In a lot of aspects, no. Uh, is Arch Linux really faster than Ubuntu? I didn't. I didn't read this one when it was relevant, but I read it later. This was posted back in 2010. You know, I was just graduating high school. <laughs> <laughs> and what what was the what was the result? Uh, Arch boots faster than Ubuntu, but in daily usage, it's actually not really any faster. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Because you know I, this was back when this was this was back in the day when Ubuntu was still using GNOME two, and GNOME two was pretty dang snappy, still yeah. is. <laughs> uh, and you know it's just talking about articles like that. <clears throat> oh yeah, also Steam for Linux uh, when that announcement came out. But I have been a long time reader of Pharonix. Uh I haven't always paid for like Pharonix Premium because you know I mostly just read the headlines. But. Uh, it is a valuable resource because, uh, in in this re- regard, because Pharonix is a very community facing facing website, and with it being twenty years, this gives it like credibility in my eyes from like a news organization. Because yeah. uh, how long has? Uh, let's look at the other outfits. Uh, it's Foss. They don't even post news article articles a lot of the time. A lot of it's just like tip guides and stuff like that. So. Do we really trust that uh, them to like be a credit cre- anywhere near a credible news resource? Uh, the only one that's really co- uh, competitive with Pharonix in this regard is LWN, and the, yeah, and, and of course LWN specifically covers Linux kernel development mostly. Uh, they cover other things, but it's mostly kernel development. And uh, it's great if you're already a C programmer. I can tell you that much. If you're not a C programmer, you don't know what the hell they're even talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm happy about that. Congratulations, Michael Larble. Hope hope uh, you're in good health and you can keep going because sometimes you make me wonder if you're getting any sleep whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, you know, Big Pod, this little thing here just started blinking a blue light at me, telling me that it went that I went to a sleep state. And but, what uh, is that? Uh, this is a wonderful device. It's got a KDE logo on the back of it because I bought the KDE version. Uh, this is a Pine 64 Pine Phone, the original one, not the Pine Phone Pro. Hmm. Uh, this is actually their pre-release model community edition, which is why it's got the KDE logo on it. And uh, yeah, of course, the very first thing I did was... Uh, get rid of this KDE thing, and we installed uh, <coughs> Mobian, which uses Fosh by default, which is uh, GNOME. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because, you know, it turns out that GNOME apps work better on the Pine Phone than the KDE apps, or at least they did at the time. And they... I haven't checked lately, but last I heard, they still kind of do. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, uh, Big Pod... When was the last time you heard anything exciting about a Linux phone? A really long time. The last exciting thing was PinePhone Pro. Yeah, the PinePhone Pro. And when was that? Like 
two years ago? Something like that. Yeah. And before that, the only interesting thing was that Sony literally supports Linux as an install option. Or like, at least they, they have certain level of allowance for it. They may not warranty you, but I mean, they're, uh, they're enabling it. Yeah, they they haven't locked the bootloader. Yes, that's basically what that's basically what it is. They and haven't locked they, the bootloader. They on tell bootloader. you which kernel goes with which uh, phone. Yeah, which good guy Sony. Yes, thank you for thank you for being a Chad in open source because you know not all of these other hardware vendors are Samsung, <laughs> but uh, uh, depending on where you get your phone. Yeah, it depends on what part of the world you buy your Samsung phone yeah. from. Because, you know, other parts of the world have laws. <laughs> yeah. I, I but, can, uh, no matter what what Sony is, I can, I can really go and just enable uh, the unlock of, uh, what's it called, unlock of the bootloader. Like, press a button and it's unlocked. It yells at yeah. me, but it is unlocked. Yeah, but uh, anyways, uh, this is... This is a Pine phone. It's running the latest version of Mobian. Uh, how do I know? Because I updated it today, so I, at least I know that's got the latest version on it. Uh, using my fancy new caching sh- server that I discovered for for uh, Debian, which uh, that's pretty hot. I might do a video on that one of these days. Who knows? But uh, it got it got me wondering, like uh, over the past few weeks, is there anything going on in Linux Mobile? And the answer is sort of. But it's really? nothing. It's nothing like super flashy. We're not getting hardware. We're still getting software. People are still people are still porting dri- uh, drivers uh, to to Linux, and they're still maintaining drivers. And uh, there's still a guy still trying to figure out how to get the camera working on the Pine Phone Pro. <laughs> he's got it kind of working, but he's waiting. He's waiting on a series of patches coming from Lib Camera because he's not using V4L. He's using entirely Lib Camera libraries for this, which. That's what he should be doing. Yeah. But uh, it's led to basically this product, that, this uh, phone that you bought two years ago with promised camera support, but it still has no camera support. <laughs> yeah. I think that there is a Manjaro image that you can install on it and get a working phone, but at the same time, I'm not a big fan of Manjaro, so I typically tend to stay away from them. Uh, but... Uh, it's just like okay, so if nothing, so if nothing hardware wise is going on exciting from Pine sixty four, let's look at the other comp competitors. Uh, well, I found two competitors. Really? Because well, technically I found three, but the third one kind of just doesn't exist. So there are two competitors. Uh, if you're in the U.S., uh, there is a competitor called Purism, <laughs> and they make a phone that they call the Librem five. Yay. Now, uh, good old Libram. Yeah. Now, this is the GNU phone. First of all, it is GNU, completely free, completely open source. It is a bad phone from like a usability standpoint. Just saying that right now ahead of you. Ahead and of from everybody. price perspective. Uh, from price from price perspective, you're you're paying the engineering tax on it. So, uh, you're paying like nine hundred dollars for a phone. That basically performs as well as uh, your 12-year-old Android phone. Might be a little bit better than that, but that's basically what it is. Uh, now, that that's the, actually not really a big problem for me. Because I understand what the phone is, and I appreciate what they're doing with it. My problem comes with the history of their, of their shipping. Because uh, purism has had a lot of issues shipping product. Really? Yes. And there's a no refund policy. Oh. Yeah. So not only so not only did you buy your product two and a half years ago, but it has yet to show up and you can't even request a $900 refund. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's nothing exciting coming out of that. The uh, next one is a uh, Volaphone, which is a company that I think that they sell exclusively in uh, Europe. 
because it's a very European looking written language on their website that I can't read because I'm American and I only and I only speak and read English. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think the website is literally like voila.phone. Uh you mean voila.online? Or is it Yeah. They, but I saw pictures of the phone, so I think it's a, that it's a correct company. Uh it looks to be at least their SSL cert uh renewed in the last yeah. uh, year so i think well, that they're still good i think i found english version of the website so you could read it but it's like they have their own os like vola os or something like that right yeah okay, then we're yeah the, uh, they have like all it. os uh this is they they detailed this all on kickstarter which they haven't posted an update for the phone since 2023 so they are prim makes... primarily looking at uh, Android, but they do have an Ubuntu Touch uh, install. Yeah, yeah. So uh, nothing exciting happening from there. No. Now, now I, I, were... I would like to throw you a curveball. What yeah. about tablets? Because it's basically the same device, just larger screen. Well, uh, there is some news going on with tablets. Because and this is mostly circulating, uh, mostly from like the Ask Noah show, which is another podcast, because uh, Noah Chalila, Chalaya, uh, the host there, actually did pick up a uh, a Pine sixty four tablet, and he's been talking about it a lot. So there's been some buzz renewing in that space, and I know that Katie is making some big news with her Plasma Mobile specifically on tablet, but not the phone. Well. I would say that the newest Linux, in quotation marks, for those of you who cannot see, a tablet that will become actually useful will be soon called, or is called, Surface Pro. Well, of course. <laughs> that, 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 that will be a, an actual tablet that will be like pretty usable. Yeah, that's if, uh, that's, that's if a certain vendor that... Uh, puts their name on the front cover of that box it doesn't lock the bootloader because you can totally lock bootloaders on arm yes but from a, a probably they probably won't at least they haven't on any other device they haven't ARM. yet yeah they haven't yet they probably won't i hope yeah i really really but, hope because i like surface pro well i, just don't, I just uh, don't like windows on it so Snapdragon, uh, with with these new uh, ARM CPUs that they're coming, they already announced that they're going to be supporting Linux on it. Yeah. So if that chip makes it makes its way into Surface Pro Pro tablet, uh, so, uh, so a later Surface Pro will have uh, the, it's been announced will have Snapdragon X Plus and X Elite chips. It was announced yeah. a couple of weeks ago, right before the Microsoft Build conference. Which, uh, you know, if uh, if they make it relatively easy to install Linux onto it, that could be pretty exciting. But it doesn't come with Linux. Yeah, yeah. And I and I'm and I'm looking and I want to find devices that come with Linux, not that I can boot Linux onto. Because if it comes with Linux, that's what matters for for uh, usership. Yeah, yeah. But because uh, who is going to take their working phone? And make it a potentially not working phone. Yeah. But my question is, in reality, how many people will go on the internet and buy a, uh, buy a phone off a website instead of going to their service provider? That too, yeah. Got to get it on the store shelf. But, yeah. Uh, that is the current state of Linux phones from like a... 300 mile perspective because that's how much I've yeah. been I've been able to find to care about it same uh, you can always send us an email if uh, you've got some more up to date information than what I've got maybe there actually is something exciting going on and uh, my my search engine algorithm is not supporting it who knows who knows <clears throat> uh, I have a question for you yes. you mentioned a Debian cache server during this, uh, during this uh, segment. Uh, yes. Now I want to yes. know, have you bootstrap Debian yet? I have. Okay. Okay. So the reason why I set up this caching server, 
because I because that because I saw that and I'm like that could actually be potentially very useful. Because uh, when I go to Bootstrap Debian, I st I still haven't done this in a VM yet, so I still don't know exactly what I'm doing. I haven't been through those steps, and I'm probably not going to commit to it until I, like I intentionally break my desktop computer. <laughs> so you so you haven't yet. I haven't done it yet, but oh, yeah, I, I, and I know, I know you're you're sad because I know that you used to do this quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is a bit. Yeah, but uh, and I know that I said I was going to do it like right after the last recording, but then I kind of had to go do family stuff, and then I forgot about it. Then I put it off, and then uh, my World of Warcraft addiction kicked in, so I started playing World of Warcraft. <laughs> 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 and then you know we just didn't get around to doing anything else potentially useful over the, over the last week. So uh, no, I have not bootstrapped. Stripe Debian yet. We might have to do a distro hacking episode where I bootstrap Debian on my desktop computer just so I can actually do it. <laughs> because you know, some that's sometimes why why uh, I commit to installing Gentoo is just because I'm doing it live. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh to uh now uh there is another Debian de based distribution. Well Debian derived, I guess would be the more proper way to say it. Uh Rhino Linux. Have, uh, have you ever heard of Rhino Linux before, Big no, Todd? No, no. Okay. Uh, have you heard of the Rolling Rhino project? Yes. Yeah. And I even, so, even saw the precursor to that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, for the people that don't know what Rolling Rhino is, can you give like a top-level explanation of it? <clears throat> rolling Rhino is essentially rolling uh, Ubuntu. It started out as a script created by Martin Wimpress. Then somebody used that script to create a distro called Rolling Rhino. And I guess now it's Rhino Linux. Well, li Rhino Linux is based off of Rolling Rhino. Ah, I don't know. I don't know if it's, I don't know like if it, if they're like the same project, hmm. but Rhino Linux is a Linux distribution built off of the Rolling Rhino project. And it is Rolling Release Ubuntu built off of, I think they pull from the daily re re repo. Yeah, that probably... So uh, you're potentially living dangerous using the, using this. Uh, just going to say this very right dangerous. now. Very dangerous. Yeah, very dangerous. I, I lived you know, that life for a while. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, uh, this is where Canonical does crazy stuff. Just yeah. letting you know. Uh, but uh, they run a very heavily modified XFC environment using the Packstall uh, project as well, which is basically an AUR equivalent for Ubuntu. Yes, this is a thing. I know it's a thing. I saw, I saw it. I was always. Yep. I I, yep. I am I am showing disapproval with my face right now. Uh, he he. We are playing fa we are playing uh, face to palm right now. So yes. yes. Uh, anyways, anyways, uh, they came out with a brand new <clears throat> release. Now, why am I marking this? Because their last release was April of last year. Wait, it's a rolling release distra. Why does it have releases? Well, I think that these are image releases, kind of like what Manjaro does. They when they uh, come out with a new release, technically it's just a new image. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. To, yeah, yeah. But uh, they uh, ran into a bit of an issue, and that's why it took so long. Uh, the the It turns out that uh, the Rhino Linux project was basically just, like, one guy. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, people started helping him just, just out of uh, joy for it. And then there were some people that really started helping him. And then he started getting burned out. Because, you know, that's just, what happens. That's, that's just what happens when, like, your project <coughs> makes it big. And then you're getting all these bug reports, all these people coming in, p applying patches and all that. You don't yeah. know what's going on. And next thing you know, you have these downstream, these uh, these uh, contributors that are co constantly complaining about the developer documentation. Just absolutely sucking because it's never good. Uh, and then... Uh, 
At that point, it, you have to create you, a team. You you just uh, take a minute, and you have that thought come across your mind, going like, "Do I really want to do this?" Yeah. And you're on that slope. <coughs> it's just like, do you stop, or do you keep going? Well, in this case, he decided to pause. Ah. Oh, that makes just sense. Just complete pause. Because he's just like, everybody, let's take a minute. Let's work this out. Uh, I got this off of its boss. It, it, you know, the news website. <laughs> but uh, uh, they put they posted this blog post called Error Evaluating, Rethinking, and Rebalancing Our Rhinos. Uh, Big Cloud, I don't think I linked this to you. I should probably link this to you right now. Yeah. But... He, it's fairly short, but basically what they did was they did a big pause on the project. Go like, hey guys, let's pause, and let's work on the developer documentation. Let's come up with like a strategy guide because you know I can't be approving every single one of your commits because you know that's that's just too much work for one guy to do. And yeah. uh, let's let's uh get let's work on making like this Paxall this uh Pax script thing that we're using for Paxall to uh, work a little bit more reliably because, you know, it's AUR packages for Ubuntu. Just don't trust them to begin with anyway, and you'll be fine. But, uh, yeah. Uh, they, they decided that they were, that they decided, they put the pause on that. They worked all that out, and they're back to work, which is good because yeah. uh, when it comes, this is an exciting project because it's just like, what would a rolling release of Ubuntu actually look like? A right? giant mess. It, I mean, yes, I would assume it would be a giant mess. And, uh... I don't have to assume. I know. Yeah. And, uh... This is a project that, uh, you know, I'm keeping, like, a thousand-foot view of. Uh, I'm not gonna... I'm not... I don't typically take any, like, Linux distros particularly seriously until, like, they prove that they can last. And when I say that they prove that they can last, they have to survive for at least three years. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because, uh... If the distro has not been around for at least three years, I don't want to install it on, install it on to my system and somehow manage to stay on that system, that the installation for long enough to find out that the developer just randomly disappears on you. Yeah, well, there is there is another metric. If it is a team, not a single developer, then it has much more staying power anyway. Yeah. Uh, so uh, they, they've got that worked out. They're back to releasing software, and I'm happy about it. Good. <laughs> now, I would like to know, and probably, actually, not not I don't know from you, but I don't know from our viewers. Uh, how could we monetize our podcast? What would you like? We are still taking submissions on over our, our our email. Josh, what's the email? I always forget. Oh, it's a uh, contact at tuckspace dot com. I figured you would recognize this now because you, you you've received the emails from it. <laughs> yes, I always forget. <laughs> and yeah, send us your recommendations how we should monetize this podcast because we are self hosting it, and that does bring some financial burden on Josh. Yeah. Now, of course, uh, if you throw us enough money. I might consider like doing the whole product shipping thing, but uh, that I don't want to do that because you know it turns out that even though this uh, self-hosting this podcast it does cost us money, uh, international shipping costs more money. Yeah, <laughs> and if I'm going to be shipping like merch product, I at least want to make sure that big part gets some of it too. <laughs> and they need to be good merch, so yeah, it, it has to be. It has to be of a certain quality. I'm, because you know, I there is a local t t shirt printing shop in my area that I would love to use because I love the people there, but I don't want to give them a super cheap shirt to print on. Yeah. <laughs> and I know that, and I know that they, that their print work, pretty good quality, like uh, bet better than I've seen out of like Walmart at at the very least, where you know you you buy a shirt. You buy one of the shirts from Walmart that has all the art on it, and it just starts peeling after a year. Uh, there, theirs doesn't seem to do that. To do that, so uh, if I was to like do, start doing the t-shirt thing, I would probably go through them first. You know, see if they're at least willing to pick up a contract to work with me. But uh, 
at the same time, it's just like, I don't really buy t-shirts, but I do tend to buy coffee mugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Big Pot, I'm, so, I'm, I'm sure you've seen my coffee mug collection a couple times. You yeah. haven't seen every single one. I can guarantee you that. And I have. I, I think I can I can guess how your, co- uh, your t-shirt collection looks like. White shirts. It's either white or it's gray. <laughs> so it's it's not particularly exciting. But uh yeah, let us know. Uh cuz I'm curious. Cuz you know, I could just do the Patreon thing. And, you know, just put put make make a Patreon just like, "Hey, uh, if you want to if you want to support us, uh, support us on Patreon." But at the same time, I'm not a big fan of Patreon the company. I'd rather go through Libera Pay. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, uh we you I'm not completely opposed to like the Bitcoin thing, but mm. I know that Big Pod, Big Pod's a little shaky on that. I am not exactly a fan of it, yeah. for various reasons. Uh, that said, if we're doing the Bitcoin thing, I'm self-hosting the node for it. I'm not going to go through like Coinbase or anything like that, because <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want to actually have my digital currency, and I want to make sure that I still have it. <laughs> Thanks, FTX. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think that's most of the show. Uh, if you want to talk to us directly, you can do it on our Discord. It's on the in the descriptions, uh, show notes, whatever. But don't expect us to actually respond because I think we both put it on silent, exception of the internal channels, right? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> we we will still get any response that you give us, yeah. and uh, I do occasionally read it. Yeah, uh, I don't I don't super rely on it, but you know if you want to super get our attention, uh, there there are these links that supposedly magically appear. Yeah, and uh, you can find us on Mastodon. We also have these YouTube channels. Uh, and uh, you know I have. A video that could be uploaded. Just saying. So do I. Yeah? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Is yours coming out on Thursday at 2 p.m.? No. No. No? So Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time? <laughs> because, you know, that's when I, whenever I publish my videos anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I do it Monday, midnight, uh, European Time or UTC. Okay, okay. Well, at least at least we have a schedule yeah. for when our video is supposed to publish, not when we actually publish the video. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, guys, that that's it for the show today. We'll see you guys later. Goodbye. <laughs>